Good evening. I'm Pittsburgh City Councilman Daniel Lavelle. And I'm Councilman Robert Ricky Burgess. And we welcome you back to Black Pittsburgh Matters. Black Pittsburgh Matters is a series of virtual town hall meetings affirming a citywide agenda that Black Pittsburgh does indeed matter. Black Pittsburgh Matters means that Black lives matter. We must protect the health and safety of Black people. It means that Black communities matter. We must focus on rebuilding Black communities. And it means that Black wealth matters. We must focus in on increasing Black employment and entrepreneurship. The Black community has been disproportionately affected by concurrent crises. The COVID-19 pandemic and its resulting economic crisis and um, the great tension around race relations, both which are public health crises. Normally in times of crisis and great change, we'd be coming to you as the Black elected officials of Pittsburgh, having meetings across the city with our constituents, partners, and allies. Since we cannot do so safely in the current pandemic, we're now using this media and platform to come to you in the ways in which we can to talk about what we're doing, and discuss policy and legislation concerning Black Pittsburgh. These means will be available via Facebook, YouTube, and the city's cable channel. You can contact or ask questions via the Black Pittsburgh Matters Facebook page or email us at blackpghmatters at gmail.com and you can comment through our live feed right now. Today's town hall meeting topic is city programming for black youth. As mentioned, um, one, uh, one concern across our city um, that people have is programming for city youth. And it needs to be noted that through the Office of Equity, um, one of the goals is equity within programming for black youth. And over the years, we have worked to increase our summer youth employment program as one example to give students both the hard skills and soft skills they need to be successful in their career. And Rev, you may want to talk a little more about this because you began pushing this even before I got to council, but it needs, note, needs noted that last year through our city youth employment program, we had the highest number of youth being employed. We've also expanded, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you can potentially be even up to like 21 or 22 and participate and this year is our goal to ensure that any youth that applies will have a career opportunity. It's really been a great program. It's in two folds. There's the high school kids from 14 to 18 slot. And then there's a second slot for older uh, young people, 18 to 22. I think when I first came to council, I, I can't remember, we may have spent 300,000. Now we're way over a million dollars. Um, it has been one of the most successful things that we've done as a city. I'm, proud to sit on the advisory board overseeing the programming. And, and it, what's important is the city is not just giving money to kids, but it's, it's, it's giving them both the hard skills and soft skills. Hard skills is the technology, the, the actual technical skills they need to be successful. At the same time, it teaches them the uh, soft skills, the people skills, and the communication skills. They're being placed, not just cutting grass and you know playing basketball, but they're also um, being placed as some of our Fortune 500 and corporate entities where they're learning accounting and actually learning what it's like to uh, work every day in a professional workplace. Yeah, which is tremendous um, because part of what we know is that for many, our youth will actually help in many, many ways educate their parents um, because of the educational system, because so many of our parents have not gone very far in their own learning when these children are coming home with these skills and with this education, they're actually informing a much larger ecosystem, which, been, which is largely beneficial to the black community as a whole. Yeah, because the, the job markets have changed. Um, when I was a kid, my uncles um, all went to the mills and could immediately go from high school to employment. Uh, that's not quite true. The new jobs are going to be mostly in technology. So mm -hmm. we have to, we have, to, we have to eliminate the digital divide and prepare these young people for the positions that the, technolog the technology center is going to provide. If they're not uh, tech savvy, if they're not, of course, internet um, uh, competent, it's gonna be very difficult for them to have employment in the new, in the new business economy. Yeah. Well, good. So tonight we are honored to be joined by Chief Equity Officer and Deputy Chief of Staff, Majestic Lane, Max Dennison, Digital Equity and Inclusion Manager for the City of Pittsburgh, and Joshua Gilliam, Gilliam my brother's Keeper Coordinator. Welcome to this evening's Town Hall. 
Thank you. Thank you, Councilman, both of you for this opportunity. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all. Us again. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, so maybe we can begin with uh, Chief Lane. Um, one, maybe if you could just do two things. One, just for anyone who may not have seen <clears> this previously, if you could just tell us what the Office of Equity is. And then maybe from there, if you could talk to us a little bit about some of the administration's, the mayor's sort of goals and priorities on in terms of Black youth programming. Sure, thank you. Um, so in short, the Office of Equity is an office created in May of 2019 um, as an evolution of an engagement around neighborhood empowerment, but we started to understand that our issues that were going on in our community were not just neighborhood issues, but were truly racial issues, truly gender issues, and issues that were cutting across the city to have negative impacts um, on many Black people within, within our city, and of course our region, but we, we focus on on the city. So it was to really break things down and to identify what were some of the issues and then partner with pe people like, you know, the council people and other folks on solutions to that. But we wanted to root it, we wanted to identify it and call it what it was to be moving for equity um, for all citizens of our city, but especially, obviously, um, African American citizens who have been here for a long time. And so, for to your second point, um, within the idea of, of equity, we know that equity is not just something that happens at one time or one event. We know that equity is about a, a culture and it's about an entire process and, and looking at people from, you know, cradle to career. And so what we wanted to do was really start to think about what are the things that matter for, for young people and for Black youth in particular, who we know um, through the education system and through and, engagement with the criminal justice system often find themselves having negative impacts and often find themselves, um, you know, having indicators that show that things are inequitable at a very young age. So one, it was the identification of how do we connect to that, which at that point was the kind of broadest national push towards black men. Right. And that of course is, you know, um, my brother's keeper uh, work that has been happening, uh, that hadn't been happening with President Obama and still is happening all across the country. And Josiah will talk a bit about that. And that's just really connecting our work with this national network and also with local people who have been and are doing that work, coordinating it, and then also expanding based on the six core areas that my brother's keeper began to talk about. So it really was aligning us with people across the country around how do we, you know, think about black men, black boys and men, and also kind of focus on, on that population. Secondly, was the idea, um, as both, both of you have talked about, we know about the Pittsburgh of the past, we know about the Pittsburgh of the present, but what's happening with the Pittsburgh of the future. And for a city that has been the pioneer and may be actually the most important city in the world for, um, for AI and self-driving cars and things like that, that's happening just literally in Oakland and in Hazelwood, how are we thinking about how our young people are going to be engaged and how are we using our assets, right? How are we using our assets that we have as a city to be able to do that? And so really if it was for us, we know that part of equity is we can't just talk about tech jobs and the difference in income when someone gets to be 21 or someone gets to be 17, because we know in many, many times that that difference is, is being created every day, that we're not engaging and thinking about the incomes of the future. So really it was this broad uh, broad view. And this is you know the, the work that you hear about that Max does is also in connection with much of the other work that goes on inside of our, our rec centers, inside of our physical assets. But it's really about how are we giving a comprehensive experience, right? How do we make sure that people are getting this comprehensive experience and getting the things of the future and being connected to the resources that they need in order to flourish as young people. And also just to say one more thing about uh, Learn and Earn, this, you know, and, and the great work in Councilman uh, Burgess, thank you for your role on the, on the advisory board. Um, I serve as a mayor's representative on the Partner for Work. And what we found is that to your point, now we're not just serving young people from 11 to 15, 11 to 16, but actually college students 
who are coming back to Pittsburgh, black college students are coming back to Pittsburgh, giving them opportunities to work at Mellon Bank, UPMC, the city of Pittsburgh. We actually hired a young person who worked with us during the summer and they began to work in, um, in HR um, at the city. So it's not just kind of like talking about it theoretically, but actually doing it and making sure that every young person who needs an opportunity in the city to work during the summer is there with <laughs> millions of dollars and also hours of experience that young people are getting. And it's an on-ramp, not just to pay, but an on-ramp actually to opportunity and an on-ramp to further education. So Max, um, talk about the programs. We know that unfortunately, uh, many of our young people, their exposure to the internet is through their cell phone. They, they, some of them, you know, um, don't really know how they, 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 they're around computers, but they may not have laptops. They may not even have computers at the home. So kind of what are we doing in, in this? What kind of programs are you, you doing to kind of uh, deal with the, you know, digital, the digital divide and um, bringing inclusion in for our young people across the city? So, um, so the initiative that we that I actually work on is Rector Tech, and the way I kind of look at Rector Tech is, if you think of an uh, of an umbrella, because we do want to have a comprehensive experience, uh, not just tech, but how do you take a kid that's ten years old that's growing up in on, on the Hill District or Bell Suver, and get him to a computer science degree, and what will he need from ten to that age, and how can we help in that pipeline? So I'm just gonna outline some of the programs we're working on right now um, and how they kind of work along with the pipeline. So <clears throat> every Tuesday from four to five, kids can uh, sign on with me with the city and it's called Coding with Mr. Max. And it's, we take them through, um, every week we work on a separate project. So it doesn't matter if it's your first time or your 50th time, we're gonna work on something different and the uh, project is beginning to end within that hour and a half time frame. Uh, so we learn JavaScript, which is the most used language in the world. We use Python and, and, a, and these languages may be unfamiliar to the audience listening, but these are the languages that, are, that create Netflix. These are the languages that create Facebook uh, and all the other technologies that we use. So when I'm talking to the children, I say, hey, do you use Netflix? If you do, you should learn Python. It, do you use Facebook? Do you use Instagram, Snapchat? Um, in a way that they feel connected to, uh, you know, if you just say, hey, do you know how to code Python? It's gonna seem unfamiliar to them. So we have Coding with Mr. Max every Tuesday. Uh, we also have um, our clubhouse where we partner, um, we partner with other organizations and just to give different looks at STEM, uh, oftentimes my specialty is coding, computer programming, software development, but there's so much more to technology and STEM than just coding. There's artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, video gaming. There's a, a million different ways you can get into tech. So we've been partnering with STEM Coding Lab and some of the programmers over there that just give different looks. And this happens once a month. Again, this is all digital for the time being, but you can come in and you can build a video game maybe one month and then the next month you may build a website just so we give them a different mix. Uh, one of the most thing, one of the most exciting things we've been working on, and we've only done two, um, is really a conversation called Tech Talks. And what we've done with Tech Talks is we've brought in STEM professionals that are actually black and brown or women. And we're having conversations with them about what it's like to be a STEM professional. And I think that is probably one of the most important uh, themes because oftentimes you may have a kid who wants to be in tech, but has, has never seen a computer engineer, has never seen a, 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 a structural engineer. And we've had two people, we had Jamal Davis who works um, with user interface um, and interface design. And he's breaking down terms that may be difficult to the general public and they may not have a person they can call on the phone and talk to or ask questions about these things. Um, but he broke it down in such a simplified manner that if you paid attention to those conversations, you could get a ground level into what it would be um, like to be a UX or a UI designer. We also had Tiffany Marie, who's a Perry graduate, born and raised in the city. And now she's making a ton of money as an engineer in DC. 
and she's just breaking down the barriers, what you're going to face if you're a young woman and you want to be in tech. She actually had a counselor who told her she should go into nursing because tech wasn't a field for women. So we want to have these conversations uh, because young ladies may want to be an engineer and may not have anybody around them who can have a conversation about what it's going to take to be an engineer. Um, lastly, we have a couple things coming up this summer. We're partnering with STEM Coding Lab to provide uh, a six-week camp in which the kids will learn robotics, they'll learn uh, some AI and some other computer science. It'll be held at Phillips Recreation Center um, and it'll be all through the week. We're really excited about partnering with them. And lastly, we're still working to implement our, um, we were part of a, a relationship with Digital Harbor out of Baltimore and we were granted uh, the National Science Foundation grant uh, which will allow us to partner with other community organizations to implement STEM learning. So those are the five main things we're working on, but they're all surrounded. <clears throat> all of the ideas are surrounded by getting STEM out to the community and where it's accessible, where it's free, and where kids can come and learn at any level. So before we move on real quick, because I'm embarrassed to, to acknowledge that I didn't know half, some of what you just said. Um, for the, for someone watching or for even if, as I know of other small children, how do, <clears throat> excuse me, what's the easiest way for them to get involved with coding with Mr. Max or the six week program at Phillips? Is, say just go to the city website, like how should they get their children engaged? So uh, I'm glad you said that. So you can go to the city page. We have our own page, Rec to Tech, and everything we're working on is on that page. You can click a link and sign up immediately. Um, and then it'll give you all the instructions and the places you need to go. Uh, it, even the, the coding with Mr. Max. And I, that's kind of how I, if you're scared, if you're afraid, if you don't really know anybody and you think you're interested in tech or you think you're interested in coding, I would tell you to sign up for coding with Mr. Max. We've had kids as young as eight, seven, jump on all the way up to 16, 17. Uh, and then if you don't like it, it's only one session. I only took one hour out of your life. And you could go on doing whatever you're doing. But if you do like it, we're there consistently. And the reason why, you know, when I talked to the director, Ross Chapman, my, my director, Ross Chapman, I was telling him that we have to have consistent programming. That's part of the problem is that you get the kids feet wet and then they go for two or three weeks and then they can't find anywhere else to learn. So we have to have consistent programming. So uh, rain, sleet, snow, if you have a computer and you have Wi-Fi, which is important why we have to attack the digital divide and make sure every kid has a computer in their house, you could come on, you don't have to know anything, every Tuesday from four to five and code with me and I'll walk you through it and we'll go over terms and slowly but surely by the end of the year, you'll, you'll know more than your parents, I promise you, about the computer. If I could just jump in, if I could just jump in real fast, just... Uh, to, to talk about some, I think, what Max is doing. And, um, you know, we may say, okay, you know, Max is doing coding for kids between four and five, but we were actually chosen um, from, for a national grant that he kind of spoke of with Digital Harbor out of Baltimore, who are the pioneers kind of really at looking at digital education for young people in neighborhoods in very real ways and received a grant along with the National Science Found from the National Science Foundation to that end. So I think... Uh, my point about that is to say that what we've really been thinking about is how are we going to start prepping our young people for the future and how do we give them the base and the base actually coming from work that is happening in the city, right? So it's not saying you have to go to another program or, you know, and I, I support all the programs that have been happening uh, supported by philanthropy and also by some of our universities, but how can the city actually do this? Because we bemoan how tech is harming our neighborhood in negative ways, but aren't always thinking about how we're going to be the solution and to start to turn that around. So that's something that through this administration, we've been able to start thinking about and doing. Well, I will say, although this is not on the program, but that's why it's really important that the schools and the city have an integrated relationship because we're, we're, we're both trying to help these kids, right? And so the school district can't be separate from the city. The kids, when they go to school, they're coming back 
home to the city. They're going to be coming to our rec centers. They're going to be coming to our after school programming. They're going to be. And so that's why it's really, I think, important because I'll be honest with you, we know the achievement level is not very high in, in the public schools, at least. And for African-American kids, I think we can have a better outcome if we have all hands on deck. If we make the education of young black kids um, the priority of the city and then use all the resources, the school district, um, um, the mayor's office, council, um, after school programming, social services, church communities. I think in order to get the impact, we especially since COVID, it's going to take all of us to catch the game. That's my soapbox. Um, Joshua, talk to us about our brother's keeper. Explain to us what it is and how, um, how the city is involved. Uh, yes, sir. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and definitely um, want to you know, echo what uh, Chief Lane and Max have talked about. Uh, Rec Detect's super worth looking up, um, not just because of the implementation of programming that they've been doing and coding with Mr. Max. They've been doing videos and stuff too, all very compelling. They've been raising money about this on a national level to support these activities. So it's encouraging. I, I encourage folks to check it out. So My Brother's Keeper, um, Chief Lane mentioned it at the beginning. I think sometimes it's easy to kind of uh, explain MBK uh, to start with by what it's not. So uh, MBK is not a nonprofit organization, uh, nor is it a program. Uh, it's not like a Josiah's program with young kids or anything like that. Um, what it is, uh, is an initiative and it's collective impact. So it has all these goal areas, it works in different impact areas, it convenes and connects. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give two analogies and then an example uh, recently that I think kind of embody it. So I like to describe MBK, and this is Max terminology here, uh, as an API. Um, so, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these are all different systems. But at some point, someone writes a little bit of code so that if you want to post a picture on Instagram, you can post it to Facebook and to Twitter at the same time. You don't build another system to do that. The API is what allows those different systems to communicate. So that's the first analogy. Uh, the second is I like to say, uh, that I'm a basketball player in a football town. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, my family has roots in basketball um, and it's something I played growing up. Pittsburgh's a big sports town. It's also a big football town. Um, and when you look around, whether it's PPS, I was just mentioned, or the Department of Human Services, the Health Department, uh, the city of Pittsburgh, these are all very big entities. These are, these are huge institutions and there's long standing history uh, and then there's strategy and then you try to dedicate yourself to a way of doing business and it can kind of lead sometimes to a bit of a pugilistic dynamic, but that's football to me. Um, I'm more basketball. I like making bounce passes and chess passes. I like letting uh, folks connect uh, and get on the way because, um, you know, having started working on My Brother's Keeper while in the nonprofit space, I've never been able to be all things to all people. But doing work in this region, there's usually already someone working on something. You can connect them and they can get off uh, to the races. So, uh, My Brother's Keeper was founded in 2014 in the wake of the Trayvon Martin murder. So a lot of common notes uh, to things we've seen, you know, all too often in the past calendar year, much less, you know, uh, the recorded history of, of the nation um, and, and certainly recent history. And here locally, uh, Mayor Peduto and County Executive Fitzgerald accepted the challenge. So it's had uh, political involvement, including uh, folks from city council like yourselves and other elected officials uh, since day one. Um, and it's really been about, uh, you know, what work is happening at the community level. So the example I mentioned uh, to you, um, our theme for My Brother's Keeper this year with a focus on black men and boys is wellness. We want to emphasize and uplift and highlight any opportunity for wellness in whatever that term can mean, financially, education-wise, emotionally, physically, mentally. Uh, we partnered with P3R, the, the marathon organization, uh, and a bunch of organizations on a parks initiative because our parks are assets, it's a great way to get out and about, get some sunlight, exercise, that health and wellness theme, right? Um, MBK was invited to be a part of some of those discussions uh, and they had a, an event at uh, Bergwin Park in Hazelwood. And there was a bunch of tables like we used to do all socially distanced with all the COVID protocols. Uh, and at the My Brother's Keeper table, we had the Mission Continues, which is a great post 9-11 vet, largely run uh, service project uh, organization that's had incredible projects in Hazelwood, other places like Homewood and stuff like that, and city parks. Uh, and I think that really just amplifies, uh, uh, it kind of exemplifies what MBK is. Um, you know, if you're, if you're engaging with MBK, you get to learn about how the city thinks about its facilities. Uh, Catherine Vargas from City Parks was there with me talking about stuff that Max is doing in rec centers. 
talking about upcoming opportunities for young people um, in our parks. We also have the Mission Continues, a community partner. If folks want to get involved, uh, you know, and give back. And then they can meet all the other organizations that are there, Venture Outdoors. They could do yoga. They went on like an urban hike. They found some cool art from Baron Batch. Um, so it's really about the connections, uh, MBK, uh, and about the opportunities uh, that present themselves uh, once you take, uh, you know, that approach. Uh, we've been working on a bunch of things uh, recently. I'll highlight a, a couple of them. Um, the first is a, pl a project with the Obama Foundation. So MBK is, is nationwide. There are hundreds of cities, communities, and tribal nations that are part of the network. Pittsburgh and Allegheny County are just two of those, and uh, the network of hundreds. Uh, we're working with the Bloom Bloomberg Associates and the Obama Foundation on something that's called the Equity Indicators Platform, uh, something that you council people, uh, I think, will be very interested in. I'm excited to talk with you more about it. Uh, it's a dashboard. Um, it takes a, a lot of the, the data from the regional data sharing agreements uh, through the county with various school districts, uh, community-based organizations, public safety, et cetera, and puts them in this very interesting uh, user and easy to use user interface so that community-based organizations, uh, researchers, uh, folks at the city can run reports themselves. Think about the gender equity report, uh, but that data being at the tip of your finger um, and able to be played with and you can compare and contrast, okay, what does what does the third grade literacy rates look like uh, compared to high school graduation or folks coming from the re into the reentry space? You know, how are we looking at career attainment from there? Um, so that's a, that's a fun project. Again, uh, systems connecting and then providing a tool to explore um, those realities. Uh, and we've also been working with Healthy Ride, which is the ride sharing bike organization um, on this series of rides through an app they have through a national bike advocacy organiza organization called RideSpot. The idea here is very simple. Again, the parks are assets. We've got this great ride share system. We've always community-based organizations that have out of school time programs or just engagements with youth. Um, this app lets us record accessible rides from those ride sharing bikes to a local park, uh, to other local uh, assets in a community that then an after school program or a mentoring program uh, can use to retrace. There's a cool social feature, you take pictures and stuff of the route, you know, fun facts about it, things like that. Uh, and then it's just ready-made, you know, there, you, could, you, could do, you could do five, six, seven, eight bike rides as a nonprofit, um, just using the app, going to a healthy ride uh, rack and, and, and doing it. So those are a little bit of, of examples. I'm, I'll be happy to answer more questions and, uh, and do a deeper dive as, as we continue to talk. But, but that's what MBK is, you know, it's about the connections um, and about what we can do in partnership, you know, with, with community. So the one project you mentioned, um, and part of my ignorance, I was not aware was the equity indicators yep. help me you gave me one example so let me give i'm gonna ask the question you tell me if this would fit in at all there's been a recent conversation around sort of black displacement within the city of pittsburgh um you're probably aware we had a public hearing today yeah. where people called in to talk about how many blacks have left the city of pittsburgh in the recent years i think it's seven thousand since i forget which date um, would the equity indicators be able to play a role in trying to better understand why the displacement has occurred or what's going on there? I think so. Yeah, I, you could explore various factors that might be at play uh, for how a family or uh, say a young professional that's trying to find you know, a job um, is experiencing life here in Pittsburgh along those lines. And uh, and sometimes it's not always immediately obvious. It's not just one factor, right? Which is why this dashboard is so interesting. Dashboards aren't a new idea. There's a bunch of dashboards. I'm on the advisory board for the health department's Office of Violence Prevention. There's a homicide dashboard that they've put out. You know, we, we've seen this kind of thing before. But this one's interesting because it has all these different data sets. Uh, and, uh, and I didn't say this before, it's open source. So there will be a V1 that has all the, 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 the data that the county and DHS and all these players have in it to begin with. But then we can work with university partners, folks like you uh, on, on city council uh, to build on it from there. Think like Create Lab, uh, think, think mm -hmm. like some of these, these, uh, these tech partners. We could even make it a more valuable tool for our, our current purpose. And then in, uh, in prep for this, because it's you know, locally driven, they, it's our indicators, it's our data, it's like you know, how we have it set up. I sent them the equity indicators work we did. I sent them the gender equity report. I sent them the original uh, MBK playbook. I sent them the welcoming Pittsburgh uh, roadmap, you know, so that they can see what we've been talking about and what we've been tracking so that it's even more locally uh, focused. And we'll be the only, there's two regions in the entire nation that are gonna debut this platform, Houston and Harris County and Pittsburgh and Allegheny County. 
So we have a pretty compelling you know, opportunity, uh, not just to, to, to keep it hyper local, which is the value for us, but I think also to engage you know, with other cities around, around this work. And not, not every city's done a gender equity report. Not every city has an office of equity. Not every city has you know, African-American council people. You know what I mean? So I'm really excited to see what this kind of thing lets us do. When does it premiere? Or can we play with it now? Um, we can set up a demo uh, for you. Uh, they're aiming for the end, of, like within three weeks for the f- first version to be live. The only reason I'm hesitating is because it's like a, it's a tech project, Max will tell you. These things, you know, sometimes it just, it just takes forever to get that final V1 shipped, so to speak. That's like to, to ship the code. Um, but that's, that's what we're aiming uh, for. So in like three weeks, end of May, early June. Okay. And the reason, the reason why I'm asking, this could potentially also be a very, a very valuable tool um, for city council as we begin looking at how to redistribute the ARP dollars that are going to be coming into the city. Mm -hmm. Um, As you know, Reverend Burgess and I sponsored legislation um, saying that those dollars that get dispersed need to have a racial equity lens to them. And I think the the equity indicators, as you're describing it, could potentially help in shaping where those dollars should go. So that's why it's it's really intriguing. Um, So thank you. My second question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Majestic. Oh, yeah, just. To, just so just to, to add on to that, I think um, as Josiah has really aptly put it, this, you know, we've done a fair amount of indicators <clears throat> and you've been a part of much of that indicator work and then the improvements that you can make through indicators. So I think that this one is another tool that we'll be able to use because we're often talking about the issues when our communities, but not able to parse out which ones are having the biggest impact at different times, mm-hmm. right? So for a nine-year-old, it might be the education system and we need to be able to track like what's happening, you know, what schools for what reasons are having these challenges. And then also let's see how that connects with what people are leaving the city or what people are leaving that school or how that population is going down. Right. So there's a lot of data that we can begin to comb through to help us think a little more rigorously about the challenges that we see and how we actually solve them. I think everybody understands the challenges that we have in, in our communities, but also the opportunities. The difference is we can't always get to, hey, it looks like the biggest issue for this particular school might be at this age, and then these populations of people may be the very, very same people who find themselves moving from a city neighborhood to a suburban neighborhood, and why, right? And how do we connect the, um, the educational outcomes of some of our schools or some of our uh, challenges around uh, public safety to then movement patterns, right? And so that we know that there's a confluence of issues that influence movement patterns and not just one. And we think that this document, along with other work that the office is doing, will be able to give the best information because it's like, you know, as uh, people often say, what you can't measure, you can't manage. So we're trying to get the measurements appropriately so we can manage it and then also look at solutions in this equity project. Uh, we'll make sure we send you to get the demo and uh, have the folks from Bloomberg uh, loop you in. Thank you. Yes, I, you're, of course, one of the most thoughtful people in city government. And, you know, you have a, a national platform in terms of your office. You have been involved in these talks nationally. I'm going to tell you kind of what I think, and I'd like you to sort of respond to it. One of the things that I think about um, we've been able to do as a city with Mayor Perduto and Councilman Lavelle and I, you know, this whole Black Pittsburgh Matters um, issue is not one thing, right? It's not just focused on housing, although it is focused on housing. It's not just focused on economic opportunity, although it is focused on economic opportunity. It's not just focused on safe neighborhoods, all that, although it is, not just better schools, it is. It's focused on you know, all three things, the protecting the Black Lives Matter, protecting um, um, the lives and safety of Black people. It's, you know, rebuilding Black communities. That means Black schools, Black businesses, Black organizations, all that, as well as housing. And then, of course, creating business opportunity, opportunity. Um, talk about how I think we don't necessarily to our own horn enough about all the work we've done, but how important it is to coordinate all of these outcomes together if we're really gonna impact black families and black kids. 
Yeah, no, I think I think what you're saying is is absolutely correct. I think what we have found, what I find is that we don't suffer for people who are trying to do the work, but the order of operations and the scale of the work and thinking specifically on how best to impact different places at different times is the challenge, right? And so I think that this Black Pittsburgh Matters work and the, the suite of legislations that you have worked on, the, the suite of legislations and changes that we've worked on together, um, really kind of show thinking about these things in a strategic way of how can you use advocacy, how can you use community resources, and how can you use the heft of a city to begin to look at it and to connect that to data. Because often, you know, how do you eyeball change, right? Change is not something that you just eyeball, especially when you're dealing with issues from the past 60 to 70 years and 400 years, if you want to kind of use a broader scale of, of white supremacy and racism in America. And then, but then specifically in Pittsburgh, some of the bigger challenges that we've had from loss of industry, uh, lack of, you know, kind of broad based political influence. So what we're doing is really fighting that tide, using the data and using all the things at our disposal to try to make these changes. But these things all, as you said, they're all coming together. And as they come together, you start to see the change. A house, you know, even if it's 50 or 100 houses here, as many houses and much affordable housing that has happened over the last seven, to eight years, we know that that doesn't match the scale of the wealth problem in, 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 in Pittsburgh for black people, right? So we have to tie the housing challenge to the wealth building challenge as, as we have been working on and getting into supporting incubators, getting into doing grants and loans, getting into supporting the businesses, getting into catalytic projects um, like the one that went through planning commission yesterday with the lower hill. So we know that all of these things, we have to be doing them all, measuring them all, talking about them all. And I think we have began to do something that really is a model and, and continuing to talk about what does this, what I into call intergenerational mobility look like, right? It, how are we measuring the intergenerational mobility, which is really, that's really the undercurrent of everything, really the undercurrent of, do our children feel like they're going to have the opportunities? Do the schools have the same books? Do the playgrounds have the same uh, nets? Do the playgrounds have the same sports? If you don't learn tech in the home, can you learn it at the? Can you learn it with Max? Um, where's the programs around? You know, helping the organizations that are helping some of the brothers that have been involved in some street activities, right? Like these are all the things that we actually are doing to be able to make this impact. It's just, you know, it takes it takes time for them all to make sense to actually change the lives of people. But I think you're seeing a thrust that's unlike many in the country on really having government be very purposeful, not just about statements and platitudes, but also resources, programs, and policy. And I think, so I think in many ways, you know, although the city and the mayor has been very progressive, I think, in some ways, we're too far ahead, right? That people have to catch up to where we're at, right? They they don't quite see it yet. As you were saying, it's all coming together, all these programs, but they don't see it. It's all being implemented. Its impact, as you know, is gonna be two, three, four, five, ten 10 years down the line. And I think we do have to do a better job of explaining it, which is one of the reasons we have this platform of explaining to black people that we actually are doing some national progressive, um, transformational things that are being modeled across the country. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I know at one point I'll ask Josiah to talk about um, one of our initiatives that really connects and dovetails with so much of the Stop the Violence work and the broader community health and safety work that, you know, Councilman versus Councilman, both of you have championed. But I think, and he'll talk about it, just to be another example of partnerships that allow us to do things that aren't always seen, but it's the infrastructure to, you know, keep our community safe. And once we can talk about keeping our community safe, keeping our communities healthy, then we can also talk about changing that kind of intergenerational mobility and some of the obstacles to that. And if I can just add a small point to that, just talking about inclusion and equity specifically, when we talk about inclusion and equity, particularly in the tech space, Right. So if you're a mother, if you're a single mother or a single father in the city of Pittsburgh and you want to get your child 
into a tech program. I would challenge any parent to go look at some of the uh, prices for programs. I won't say any names specifically, but you could pay up to $1,000 a week for a coding program. So why what we do is important is because if I'm a single mother, how do I afford to put three of my children in a program that's a thousand dollars a week, right? So, you know, I applaud what we're doing because we're making the opportunity to be able to work in tech and learn tech at a costly rate for free. Essentially, all you have to do is show up to the center in, in, in a space where a lot of times if the city didn't step up to do that, it just wouldn't happen because these, uh, Programs have been going on for years. They're just not accessed. And to me, that's a part of the inclusion and equity, right? If, if my mother can't afford for me to learn how to code, how am I going to learn how to code? How am I going to get that expertise? And um, I think we, we're, we're doing incredible work in that space where we're making it accessible in the areas where the children that frequent the Pittsburgh public schools, who frequent these neighborhoods are at, and we're in those spaces trying to make the opportunities real. So towards that point, you would think that a lot of this would also be happening in our schools, you would think. Unfortunately, I do know, and only because my children are elementary school, so I can't really speak towards middle and high school, but I do know a lot of what you're providing at the city level is not necessarily happening within our schools. And so I applaud you, but I'm also concerned at the same time. Earlier, Rev, Rev also mentioned that at the end of the day, it's our collective responsibility to bring our young men and women along. It's not singularly up to the schools, it's not singularly up to the city, um, nor is it singularly up to the black church. It, you, you get the idea. My, I guess my question is, and this is just open-ended, is the city or any of the programs having any conversations with the schools about how we can partner to better educate, to better inform, to better teach, mm -hmm and help our children come along or if not necessarily right now or do you have any thoughts about how we could partner better so i'll i'll start um i think there have been a number of conversations a number of engagements around some of the early dialogue around the black men and boys work that is also being done at the um at the you know public pps level as well as other schools um because it is important to think that Many of our children are being educated across the board. They're being educated in uh, traditional public schools, public charter schools, Catholic schools, private schools, right? Like, so black children are being educated largely in PPS, but not exclusively. Um, and that there are populations that we got to make sure that we're thinking about who aren't in those, in that bigger system who are also um, engaging with us um, via our other programming. So I would say that there has been some early dialogue there in another place that there has been, uh, I think, positive conversation is around uh, CTE, um, Career and Technical Education with Angela Mike and some of the leading work that she's been doing. And actually the city looking at uh, partnering with Fuse Corps. Uh, and I think that Chief Powell talked about it when we were on last time. That's a national organization that, that sends kind of mid-level professionals to help people solve a challenging problem. And one of the challenging problems to many of the things that both of you have brought up as well as we see is where's the connection from where young people are coming out of a CTE program and being connected to, for example, a partner for work, right? And being connected to a pre-apprenticeship -pre program. Um, and no matter where that may be and how can we get resources to do that? And they've been open to that, to that dialogue. Um, so I think there's been early conversations and, and on some things and a little deeper deeper stuff on that one like I just gave an example and I think the, the the challenge is how do we figure out our true shared interest like the mayor often says the you know superintendent has them from eight nine to three or eight to four but anytime after that they're being perceived as being part of the leadership of, of the mayor and council as far as who's responsible for what happens in the street, who's responsible for what happens with public safety? Who's responsible are the playgrounds nice? In the summertime, outside of the PPS programs or maybe some other programs, people are saying, what are you doing for the kids in the summertime? So there's shared accountability and shared responsibility. And I think as, as we continue to center the children, sometimes in Pittsburgh, we, we center the institution and don't necessarily center the children. 
So as we continue to center children, I think there'll be some more opportunities. And, and my hope is that when you think about what's happening with, with some of my brothers keeper work, when you think was when you hear what's happening with our, our directed tech work, which is also one just one part of a broader thrust of city parks work that is being very progressive, um, led by Director Chapman and, and Director Vargas, that there'll be more opportunities because people can see more places to kind of uh, to link in um, versus kind of being separate. And that's our goal to be able to, how can we lift up and raise these different programs that we're doing to be able to connect people to them? Yeah, if I could add anything to that, it would just be, um, just in my conversations, even pre-coming pre to the city, just making sure that the people who are in power and, uh, and in charge of the schools are not having old conversations. There's no question about it. Tech is the future, right? All of us will be connected in tech at some space. So uh, as long as when I'm in a room, people are, are, are speaking about tech in some way that we're gonna get there as far as educators, um, I'm okay with it. I just, you know, a lot of times we're fighting old battles as far as what curriculum should be and standardized testing and these other different ideas that won't necessarily, I don't want to say they won't mean anything, but in 10 years, you know, what you're exposed to right now in tech will be so much more important than whether you're, you were able to pass an SAT or some type of uh, a test that you're taking. The learning is changing. The way we're going to uh, um, learn and what we're going to learn is changing and what's important to learn is changing. So I'm just always... Uh, excited to be a part of innovative, progressive conversations about education itself, about what we should be learning and what should we should be teaching in these schools. You know, one of the things that um, is part of a national, is a national curriculum that is not necessarily always emphasized as much is this whole idea of citizenship, right? Of civic engagement and citizenship. And what does it mean to be um, a citizen, you know, what, what, is it, what does that really mean in terms of what's your responsibility to vote, what's your responsibility um, for engagement? And that's a role I think the city can naturally play, right? That's what we do. And I think that at the very minimum, that should be a place that all of us could agree um, that we want to not just raise, we don't, we want to raise kids who not only um, make good money, and not only have hopefully, you know, raise good families, but also are good citizens, right? They are, they are, they, they take our democracy seriously. They participate in the government process. And that may be an early place that we can partner and, and share some resources. Uh, I, I, um, um, I, I think that that's right. I completely Josiah, agree. Yeah. could you share, could you share a little bit about some of the MBK work and some, some things we've been working on regarding that? Absolutely. So um, completely agree uh, with you, Reverend, and anecdotally, you know, any conversation with PPS that I've been involved with or heard of as it relates to MBK and civic engagement has always been a thumbs up, uh, you know, and a yes. Uh, in fact, um, there are a number of student leadership groups at PPS uh, that are interesting for folks to, to take a look at, especially if they have young people that might be interested in. There's a participatory budgeting council uh, that was put together in partnership with Councilman O'Connor's office. Um, that I haven't heard the update since COVID, um, but was still an active initiative where young people could weigh in on uh, budgetary items uh, in a facilitated, you know, structured way. Uh, and then a leadership council that works directly with uh, the superintendent. We were invited to be a part of uh, some of the application process, meeting with some of the young people that were um, involved with that was great. Um, putting together a youth council has been something that uh, we've been trying to do uh, in the Office of Equity and the Mayor's Office for a couple of years now, something that uh, is an objective of MBK, uh, also is one of the objectives of the Welcoming Pittsburgh uh, Initiative. Uh, and, you know, council people, you know, how important it is to be, uh, to be a citizen and to understand that about yourself and what's, you know, what's possible. So any way that we can work together on that you know, we have a lot of groundwork laid um, and we have, I think, a pretty compelling opportunity to, to call a table, uh, to, to work with young people in a structured way to co-design uh, what it can look like and to really set up something that's, that's best in class. You know, there are a number of cities around the world that have an interesting take on this. Uh, Helsinki, um, and, and domestically, uh, the city of Boston has a really good uh, youth council, an MBK youth council as well, participatory budgeting youth council as well. 
Uh, I think these are all things that we can look at and we have, you know, uh, language and one pagers and, and research that we've been putting together uh, that, that looks at that. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's the right thing to do. And if you think about the last, the last year, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, you know, so much of the civic engagement, uh, and you know this Reverend, was youth involved and in so many cases youth led. Uh, so we really feel like there's an opportunity, you know, to lean in there. Um, young people are valuable uh, and their opinion uh, should, should, should matter, you know, uh, especially as we're talking about the future, you know, of this place. And hopefully we can, we can provide more structured ways uh, to do that. Maybe we can create a youth council ourselves within city government, you know, et cetera. But then also can we, can we create experiences where these youth leadership groups of which there are many, not just in PPS, you think about A plus schools uh, and team block, you think about Gwen's girls, uh, you think about BMLDI through the Urban League, you know, are there ways we can create experiences where, uh, you know, I did one with BMLDI when I first joined the mayor's office, where those young men came down, spent a day meeting with council people, just getting to know them uh, in the city council uh, chambers, uh, hearing from officials in the mayor's office. And that's all really great. I think people uh, like that idea too, no matter who you ask. So uh, we, we're, we stand at the ready to, to bring that, especially post COVID, we can get kids back in, you know, in person safely. You know, I say, I say yes and amen to all of that. So speaking of post COVID, I have a potentially a simple question because um, I was asked it yesterday. I didn't have the answer. Ha at the city level, um, have we all have we begun the conversation of opening our rec centers back up as we move towards the summer? And if so, yes. can you give me any insight? Yes, um, our rec we, centers in our fields. Our rec centers, yes, our rec centers, our fields, our pools. Um, right now, obviously, as both of you know, and the people watching may not know, getting pools up and running can be some of the most difficult work in the world, even though it, it does not appear to seem that difficult and expensive, um, and expensive to, to do. I think many people just take, oh, there's a pool. I can go swimming and not know how much work somebody had to do to figure out who was going to be there to keep everyone safe and how, how many hours and, and such. So the um, and this is also a conversation that I've been having with Cornell Jones, um, you know, around kind of the and, you know, uh, working with anti-violence work because our public, our assets can help us keep young people safe. So as we're working on the pools, that's kind of like the primary thing to kind of untie that knot. But second, which will be coming out very soon after that um, from, you know, uh, our chief operating officer, uh, Kenzie Casey, will be information around um, fields and our rec centers trying to also make sure, and this is the other the challenge, make sure we have the best of information from the county and the state around, you know, once the things are lifted, but you still have masks in place and just trying to figure out what that means for health regulations once you still have to have the masks, I think until we're at 70% herd immunity or 70% immunized, the governor just uh, recently stated. So how to, how to make that happen and then how to scale up now that post uh, Memorial Day, you can theoretically have anyone, as many people as you want in the room, as long as they have masks on, well, then how do you have staff enough to really deal with that ramping up really fast? So that's really the, the process, but folks should expect to hear something in the next couple of weeks to be able to say that this is how the summer will look given the change in uh, uh, rules uh, this week from uh, the governor. Yeah, cool. and I believe we're recruiting right now for lifeguards, speaking to, uh, to Chief Lane's point. Uh, so if you know folks that are interested, you know, you know get them involved. I do want to share something um, that uh, Cosmo Lavelle and I announced earlier this week that now you can go right to the PittsburghPA.gov website. And right on the website, there is a link. We have a new um, web page called Black Pittsburgh Matters. And on that web page, there is policies. There are instructional uh, little brief videos to explain. When, when people say that we have not done uh, things for African Americans in that city, there are now, you know, 18, 20 of the initiatives, whether it was reimagining police, the summer youth employment program, uh, rebuilding um, low income housing, the housing opportunity fund. Um, all of those things are uh, on that Black Pittsburgh Matters page that you can access now, access directly from the city's um, homepage. And we're going to link um, summer, summer youth employment into it. And some of the things we're talking about today, we're going to make sure we link it um, um, to our web page for all those who are listening. So it becomes a one-stop sort of place, or at least a one-stop initial place for those who are interested in Black communities, Black families, Black youth. 
Thank you, Rev. And we will certainly be sure to link all their all the phenomenal work that these young men are doing to that so that people can be fully aware. With that being said, we have come upon our hour. And so we have run them all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank our guests, starting with Chief Equity Officer and Deputy Chief of Staff, Majestic Lane, Max Dennison, Digital Equity and Inclusion Manager for the City of Pittsburgh, and Josiah Gilliam, my brother keeper coordinator. And I just want to thank you all for being partners with us um, in order to have significant investment in the Black community. It's imperative that we keep our community safe and peaceful and engaging our youth is certainly one way to do that. And that, that also helps us demonstrate that we are committed to rebuilding Black communities in Pittsburgh for Black people, Black people with our partners in our allies. Hey, real fast, before we hop off, do you mind if I lift up one other opportunity I think would be important for folks to know about? Chief Lane mentioned it before and I didn't touch about it on it. Do you mind? Go right ahead. Okay, sure. Um, so he mentioned uh, some of the anti-violence work and the stop the violence work. And, and we all know on this call, unfortunately, there's been a surge of violence uh, in many of our communities recently. And uh, something that there's been a lot of work on, you know, for years and years, uh, and then certainly COVID has exacerbated factors in a lot of ways. And in the past, like several months, it's been, you know, a, a real concern. And we know that there's a lot of work happening with group violence intervention folks, street outreach, etc. You know, part of my brother's keeper that I didn't mention before uh, is that we have an action plan. Uh, we have these six goal areas. We also have an action plan that's all locally uh, uh, focused, and we raised funds in local philanthropy to support that action plan. Um, and that's at the Poise Foundation. Black Community Foundation, the oldest Black Community Foundation in the entire nation's here in Pittsburgh, that's where the MBK funds are. Uh, and we want to leverage those funds, not just to do ongoing fundraising, but to support activity happening in uh, the community. Goal six in My Brother's Keeper uh, is about all of our young people being safe from violent crime and those that need it getting the second chance that they deserve. Why? Because we can look at all these metrics and all these indicators. We want the environments to be conducive to allowing those lives to thrive so that young people and families can make choices for themselves and can thrive uh, as, they, as they so choose. Um, and so we want to not just reduce violence, we want to build peace. So I've been working with Chief Lane uh, and then folks on the Stop the Violence Committee uh, that you all have put together. Uh, I met with the Homicide Review folks, Richard Garland uh, and that team yesterday. Uh, the MBK Committee, which Reverend Cornell Jones and Tylee Thompson, and a lot of these champions are on that committee um, on a micro grants process through MBK uh, to support some of the street outreach and the violence prevention intervention work that we know makes a difference in, uh, in, this, in this round. Um, and we're aiming for a simple and easy process because we know that there's a lot of ongoing activity. You know, for folks that don't know, uh, there's a public health approach to violence that the city um, and the county uh, and the state, quite frankly, uh, has adopted in a lot of ways. You can, you can Google uh, the council people on this call and hear them talking about uh, violence as a public health uh, crisis. What that means is that there are a number of entities at different levels that have been active in this space. And we have ever, there's more coordination in this space than ever. There's also more paid work and trained and equipped work in this space uh, than ever, including uh, trainings for volunteers that want to get involved, uh, faith leaders, people that respond uh, to traumatic incidences and people that put their lives on the line uh, in partnership with public safety to intervene to prevent violence you know, from happening. In meeting with these folks, we know that a lot of them, they just have simple asks, Reverend Councilperson, you know this. You talk to ask them what they need. You know, it's, it's, it's Richard Garland said a basketball tournament yesterday. Um, you know, uh, events and activities in a rec center or, or, or in a park. Uh, so we just want to move resources, you know, into that space. We know that there's other things coming, even from the federal administration, the Biden administration, you know, focus on gun violence and other resources. Uh, but, you know, Reverend, it said, uh, blessed are the peacemakers. Well, let's bless the peacemakers. Uh, and let's use this as an opportunity to highlight work that's happening, uh, to, to get resources there, uh, but then also to try to see the numbers go in a different direction. You know, before COVID, for a couple of years, we were headed in a, in a, in a better direction. Um, the, on the call yesterday, they said one homicide is too many, and I believe that. Um, so we, wanna, we want those numbers to go down because we want to build peace. So uh, folks to reach out to us. Uh, we're going to be working with community organizations to get applications in. There'll be more announcements coming out for folks to learn more information. And council people, I'd welcome you know, your partnership on this. You know so many of the people active in this space. Uh, it does not need to be a one-off. Uh, you know, ideally, this is just you know, a first, it's not even a first attempt to just work on going and, and the Office of Community Health and Safety through the mayor's office. There's a lot of folks active here. Uh, but we want to get some MBK funds, you know, moving there. And then we can talk about, you know, this later this spring and in the summer and the fall, other ways 
um, like Learn and Earn that we can focus on, you know, activities that, that can engage folks and, and get money in their pockets and stuff like that too. So uh, I appreciate you allowing the interruption, but I did want to uplift that. And if we can work on that together, that would be tremendous. Thank you. Of course, we're all willing to work together. I also want to thank all of you uh, for watching and participating in this town hall meeting. Remember, you can watch this show on Facebook, the city's YouTube channel, or the city's cable channel. By working together, night and purpose, we can transform our city, strengthen it for all of its residents. Pittsburgh is becoming a city for all by becoming a city where black Pittsburgh matters. Good evening, stay safe, and be blessed. <laughs>